Check. All right. Well, my mint was longer than the announcements, so <laughs> turn to someone next to you. <laughs> Welcome them. Now you can look back up here. All right. I just got back from uh, the Vatican. <laughs> Bethel Redding, <coughs> California. What an amazing time we had. We love it out there. If you're new, we're part of a worldwide movement called Bethel and uh, based out of Bethel, uh, based out of Redding, California. And uh, so we went to the mothership. And uh, it is always, always amazing. I mean, there's so many stuff, things I could tell. I might, I'll tell one or two during my uh, message here in a few minutes. But let me just say this. I, you know, I was struck by the, um, now I've been out there, uh, first time I went was 04. So 13 years. My daughter went out there for a couple years. And then my other one of my other daughters went out a couple years. And um, uh, so I, I've been out there a lot. And we get invited out once a year to a, Leaders Advance, which is a thousand leaders from around the world that are all as crazy as we are. And uh, <clears throat> they're from uh, China, Korea, Phil uh, Philippines, um, Australia, Africa, everywhere. In fact, this year we had a hundred Russians that came and they are like a, man, they're a tough group. They're, <laughs> they're after it, boy. They're going after God. It is so much fun. In fact, I went to an Applebee's that were full of Russians. I mean, Redding's, Redding is not a real uh, culturally diverse city. It's a little tiny city in Northern California. And uh, these Russians kind of took over the Applebee's I was at. It was just hilarious listening to them. They're, everything sounds very forceful, you know, and <laughs> this is the dynamic of their language is, is amazing. And, they, and so I actually, I was out having coffee in the church's coffee shop, trying to get into the sanctuary. And there was, there was about 40 Russians between me and the sanctuary, and it's impossible to get through there without getting whacked by the Holy Spirit. I mean, they are just, they're out there in the lobby, oh, 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 and they're all falling on the floor. I mean, it's just a magnificent place to be, you know. <clears throat> Over 100 from mainland China were there, and uh, so the dynamic was, I, I, I can't, you know, the rest of the world is kind of very excited about Jesus. Yeah. And the Americans are like, <laughs> like, so anyway, we, I, think we, I think I got a little bit uh, of an overflow from that, and uh, it was amazing. And th what happens every year, three days prior to the uh, leadership advance, uh, I'm invited out to this, uh, what they call an apostolic school. It's really, it's kind of a school, it's not really, but it's a, it's a connection of about 40 people around the world. And we get together for, to be with Bill for three days, and uh, it's... It's the, it's the pinnacle of my year, really. Cindy goes with me. We hang out with a lot of our friends. We, this year, they reserved a place up on a mountain, uh, a Shasta Mountains there overlooking Shasta Lake. It's beautiful. And, and uh, by the way, the past few weeks, I've been talking about encounter. And I just want to tie this in real quick because I really do believe that encounter is important to the Christian life. And there's been some weird theology that has swirled around for about, 2,000 years, um, that says that, you know, we don't really, I mean, God is there, we are here, and, you know, we'll be with him someday, but there's, there's not, not interaction with the Lord in very real, practical ways. How many of you know God is very practical? It really is. He, let me just say this, and I'm going to prove it in scripture here in a minute, but he cares about everything in your life. But we have this mentality, God is very busy, you know, cause, because we're busy. And we think, you know, if I'm busy, then he's got to be busy because he's got the whole world. Well, yeah, but he's God. And he's not limited. We limit him with our understanding. But he is, he is absolutely into every one of your lives and desires to be deeper into your life. And I would just advise you right now, right off the bat, give your life fully to Jesus Christ. Even those of you who are believers and know that you're going to heaven, give your life fully to Jesus Christ. You need to turn it all over to him. And he's going to make a magnificent adventure out of your life. So anyway, we're up there on the mountain. And uh, if we can get a picture, i got a picture that I wanted to put up there. Do we have that? If you could put it up. Oops, sorry, Caleb. Uh, if you can put that up. Yeah, look at this. This is a picture of the mountain that we were, we were up. That's our view. Forty of us for three days. It's uh, Shasta Lake down there. Now, if you see upside down above it, there's that uh, apostolic gathering. That was our name tag. 
It had her name on it, and there was a key on it. The key's been a theme in these apostolic gatherings for three years now. And so keys always show up. It's just, it's bizarre. But anyway, a guy took this picture because of the beauty of the mountains, and when he looked at it, he realized there's an upside-down key in the clouds. See it? Is that not weird? <laughs> now, it, and it's almost identical to the key that was on our, on our little badge, you know. So uh, the reason I'm showing you that is I don't want to weird out visitors. I know that can, but we can take it off, actually, so it doesn't weird anyone else out. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Wait a minute. Do they think that God put that cloud key in the sky? Is God able to do that? Yes. Is this the kind of people I'm with this morning? <laughs> Because the timing and the organization that it takes to put that cloud key in the sky is massive. So, I mean, did God get up on uh, uh, December 30th and 31st and say, you know, Halloween's tonight, so I'm going to put a key in the cloud? I mean, I don't, I, I don't know how that works. I just know that he is way bigger than what you think. And he's way more concerned about the details in your life. He fashioned you to be the way you are. And so the group I was with out in California were weird enough to believe that was like a confirmation. And I, I am too. You know, I just think, because I know, and that's, that's an encounter with the Lord. And by the way, so many things, I mean, the whole, that was, that was December 31st, which was also, or October 31st, I'm sorry, which was also the um, 500th anniversary of Martin Luther nailing his 95 thesis to Wittenberg door. The beginning of what we know as the Protestant movement now or the, the, the revolt against or reform of the uh, Catholic Church and on and on and on. So we, we were talking, Bill had been talking about keys and someone spoke up in our group. It's a very uncontrollable group that I'm with <laughs> out there. I mean, it's 40 world pastor leader type people and they, you know, they all got something to say. And, uh, and so one person spoke out and said, we don't have to nail it to the door anymore. We can just use the keys to open the door. And of course, you know, everyone else is like, well, that's an interesting comment. Not this group. They're like, woo! You know, they were all very excited about it. And then, of course, later on, this picture was, oh, thank you. <laughs> A key. It's funny because I was going to bring keys to the meeting this morning and I forgot to pick them up. So someone brought a key and it's, uh, let's see, it's very, very similar here. If I had an overhead projector, you could see it up there, but you know, yeah, it's the same key. Thank you. I'll give it back. Yeah, he was talking about keys. He was talking about Martin Luther and the key and how to open up. And, and, it's, and it's amazing because I've been, as it so happens, I've been studying Martin Luther the past couple weeks uh, because of this incredible 500 anniversary that's a pretty big deal. And I and also know that God goes in timings and numbers and things like that and I think that we've entered into a new phase right now of what, of what was started, this, this amazing unfolding of the priesthood of the believer, which was what Martin, Martin, really got Martin Luther fired up, is that, that it was no, we're no longer bound by one or two people that were able to do the stuff. In fact, you know, when I told you last week, Martin Luther, of course, grew up in the, uh, he was born in the Middle Ages or medieval times. Um, and there was a medieval mindset that was, was angry toward God, was fearful of God, and God brought lightning storms, God caused devastation to people. It was that kind of mentality. The whole idea of a father heart of God was not available, readily available at that time. People typically thought that God was angry at them, that God wanted to judge them. So Martin Luther grew up in that environment. Of course, I told you the story about the thunderstorm last week. He was going through the woods in a thunderstorm. There was all kinds of mysticism about that and mystical understanding of powers and elves and, and demons and witches and everything else. And, and so he was scared. He was afraid to be in, the, in this uh, 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 woods in the storm. And he had a friend killed by lightning. So he's very sensitive to the whole thing. And, and at that moment, he cried out to Mary, the mother of Jesus, mother. So Jesus' grandmother which in those times their thinking was so limited, they knew that Jesus was very busy. They knew that Mary had become busy because things had been deferred from Jesus to Mary. And so they mentioned the grandmother, and not grandmother's taking the scraps from the table, the other prayers that need to be dealt with. That's the mentality religiously that he had at that time. 
And so he cried out to Anne, Anna, Anna, I forget now, Anna, uh, Anne, yeah, to Anne. Uh, and and uh, he, he said, if you will save me from this, I will become a monk. Well, he was saved from it, so he became a monk. That was his reason for coming a monk. But he went from being a miserable person to a miserable monk. How many of you know that having a title does not change everything? <clears throat> it's true. Bound by fear. Because as a monk, he needed to confess his sins. Everyone needed to do that, but especially a monk. And he couldn't remember all of his sins. And it tormented him. He'd go to bed at night and he would, he would lay there thinking, I, I think I confessed all of them. I mean, it's, it's pretty bad when you can't remember your sins from that day, you know. There's a lot of them. You know, I can't remember it. He was tormented by it so much that he became bedfast from it. He was depressed. He was discouraged. Because he knew that if he couldn't remember his sins and confess them properly, he was going to hell. And that kind of a fear. And so here is this miserable monk. And I know what that's like. I think I've been that miserable monk at times, you know. And I, he came across a mystic in the Catholic Church who's kind of like a, a turbo monk. And uh, the mystic, his whole job is to be in the presence of the Lord, study the Word of God, fast, you know, those kinds of things. So he meets this mystic who is like exuberant. He's happy. He's full of joy. And it puzzled Martin. And so Martin, the mystic out of his compassion, removed himself, put Martin in there, and Martin had to study what he studied. And before long, the presence of God, an encounter with God, that's why these clouds in the sky are important. And whatever, what you experienced this morning in worship is an invitation to an encounter with God. You know, that sense you had, we get it from visitors all the time. They say, man, I just sensed something. I felt heat in my body. I felt shaking. I felt whatever. I mean, it's, it's, it's coming close to the Lord and encountering the Lord. And encountering the Lord, as I taught last week, brings transfiguration. It brings transformation to your life. It, when you encounter the Lord, it blows away your current world. But because now you've got a new mindset. You're like, okay, he's not mad at me. He loves me. You think of Peter when he was in the boat, and remember Jesus told him to throw the nets on the other side or throw the nets into the water for a catch, and he said, Well, Lord, we fished all night, we caught nothing. And by the way, it doesn't record Jesus answering anything about what he said. So it was probably an awkward moment. Jesus, we fished all night, we caught nothing. Okay, I'll throw the net over the water. Throw the net. You know, just to show Jesus, uh, I'm a good disciple. I'll throw the net over. And all of a sudden, whoa, this great catch of fish. Now, you'd say, you know, he'd be high-fiving everyone on the boat like, whoo, because in his world, they, they just made a ton of money. Hundreds of fish in there. It's a lot of money. So from a business, he was a businessman, Peter. So from a business perspective, he's like, whoo, I like hanging out with Jesus, you know. But the truth of the matter is, he falls down and cries out and says, I'm a sinful man. Now, see, that's what happens. When you encounter God, sometimes the, the weird thinking in our lives comes to the surface. Like Martin Luther. He began to realize that God is good, that God is a loving God, so much so. Let me just, let me just put this in some parentheses here. From 500 A.D. to 1500 A.D., for the most part, there was no singing nor music in the church. Thousand years. Because I think it was Pope Gregory back in the 5th century, somewhere back there, he said, yeah, we, don't, we, don't, we know that common people cannot worship properly, so we will, we will give it to the monks and the priests. And so literally it shut down the church for a thousand years. Not that there wasn't none, there was some, but not what you would think for a thousand years. And the worship that they had was in Latin and the average peasant or person could not understand it anyway. And so it was more like a religious ritual as opposed to true worship. So when Martin Luther has his encounter through this happy monk, the mystic monk, he encounters God and he starts to read the Bible and revelation comes to him that the just shall live by faith, that our, our walk is by faith and not by works. He became so embedded with this thinking. It was like shut up in his bones that he became a revolutionary. He was a reformist. 
and he protested. He put his 95 thesis or the things that he felt the Catholic Church needed to change on Wittenberg's door, and after that became a bit of a felon. He was a hunted man, you know, uh, because he was uh, he was coming up against huge establishment and in a large uh, 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 control through the church at the time. And so he, he comes against him, but he's a free man. man. He's so excited. He's so excited he got married. He got married. He, uh, he was exuberant, and he, he was a musician. He had some uh, lutes or something around that he would play, and uh, he'd play them, and he would sing, and before he would play, sing depressing songs. Now, did I say something wrong there, Ethan? Okay, he's got a little bit of uh, music history on him, so I want to make sure. But now he got very, he got very excited, and he started singing psalms. To the Lord, where other people could hear it in their language. And that now it's like, it's like pulling veils off of other people, like, behold the Lord. Woo! And they're like, oh yeah, I love singing about the goodness of God. It was all part of the Renaissance. It was happening all over the Western, all over Europe at that time. Martin Luther was a part of it, or Michelangelo, Da Vinci, all these various people were being lifted by the gospel of Jesus Christ in one 50-year period at the beginning of 1500s. All of a sudden, the lid comes off of a thousand years of silence and people are being set free. So they're being set free in all ways. The way they drew, the way they painted was different. They're their idea, the, the realm, the world of exploration. Christopher Columbus, 1492, is right at the cusp of this. As the Renaissance was coming forward, people started lifting their heads up and saying, what might else be out there than what I'm experiencing right now? I'm praying for America. The Christians of America to get a Renaissance in their heart where the lid pops off and they say, there's much more than what I'm experiencing right now. I want to be at the point of the spear of that here at Bethel Cleveland where we are people that are liberated in all ways. We've encountered a living God. That's what I love about it. We just didn't read about him in a letter. We know him. We have relationship with him. Amen. Amen. Right. Good. <sighs> Sorry. Get a little bit excited there. You know why? Because he who the Spirit sets free is free indeed. There's no more racism in your thinking. There's no more classism or some kind of a classist thinking. There's, I mean, you, people are people. Amen. Uh, you know, I, the Lord continues to just kind of uh, awaken me to that. There was a guy who was a part of our... our uh, a group of 40, the apostolic uh, team, you know, there's several people. These people are like, wow, using a Bill Johnson phrase, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> I mean, it was just everyone I met, you know, you're in a room full of people, you know, I, I know a lot of them now because we've been getting together for a number of years, about 10 years, but we had new people there this time. There was a, it was a guy there who was, I, I think he may have been, uh, he, I think he was Indonesian, uh, I believe, and I, I'm trying to remember that right, but I think he was Indonesian, good looking 40-year-old guy, beautiful wife. They live in Perth, Australia, and I've been to Perth, so I struck up a conversation with them. It's kind of funny because, you know, I just thought, oh, good, Bill invited some other people here this time, and we'll get to know who they are, you know. And so I started chanting with him, and he says, yeah, I said, do you pastor? He says, yes, we have a pastor. We have a church in, in Perth. He says, but let me tell you something. He said, I almost called you a few weeks ago. I said, what? He said, yes. He says, I'm a LeBron James fan. <laughs> He said, so it's been part of my life for the past 10 years. I've got to get to Cleveland <laughs> to see LeBron James play. He said, I always regret it. I never saw Michael uh, Jackson, Jordan play. And so Michael Jackson play too. That would be good. <laughs> Michael Jordan play. He said, so I'm not going to make that mistake again. So a few weeks ago, I flew all the way from Perth, Australia. Look at a map. Perth, Australia is almost the exact opposite of Cleveland, Ohio. Way at the, I've been there, way at the other end of the world. He flew over here just to see two games. And see LeBron James play. And he was like, so, so we started a conversation. We're laughing, talking about it. He goes, we love Cleveland. We loved it. I had no idea what it was like. I mean, they're just talking about the food and the restaurants and, the, you know, it's all that kind of stuff. And so we kind of became a little bit of friends, you know, and I started talking to him. And, and uh, he said, yeah, yeah. And, uh, he said, I said, what's the name of your church? He says, it's Kingdom City Church. And I said, good. Are things going well? And he says, yeah, things are going pretty well. He says, we have uh, 11 campuses in seven nations. And I'm like, <laughs> 
saying, oh, I'm a pastor. So I'm like, we have three campuses in three counties. <laughs> He says, yes, we're in uh, Kuala Lumpur, and we're in Cambodia, and we're in, we just started one in Dubai. And uh, he said, anyway, out of the church in Perth, you know, and he's telling me all these stories. And he said, we, we invaded Cambodia recently, and they had a major connection with a very high-level royal person in Cambodia that opened huge doors to them, a lady who came to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, yeah, we gathered our teams together. We sent out seven peop 700 people to Cambodia. I mean, everything he said, I'm like, the numbers <laughs> were huge. <laughs> And it provoked me. That wasn't, it wasn't like jealousy or something like that. It wasn't in comparison. It was just like, come on, wit. <laughs> Move. Uh, and he's like 40 years old, you know. So he's just telling me all this stuff. We, we became uh, as good friends as you can be in three days. We became really good friends. But he's not the only guy there. I mean, the, the, the Chinese, when they got up to speak, they talked about how that they're tied in with some of the uh, state church in, uh, this is all going to tie together my scripture here in a minute, the state church in uh, China and uh, the key guy in their city, all these things obviously I can't talk about, but the key guy in their city was just arrested as being tortured. He's a key pastor. And it's just being arrested. I mean, they are friends. We're talking a, a two degrees of separation here. I mean, these are people they know that are being tortured in China because there's too many people coming to know Jesus Christ out of the church, and so they, they've, they've showed up and told them to stop meeting together. Of course, they scattered into other areas. I mean, all kinds of things are going on. And then, and then the, at the beginning of the meeting, the vicar of Baghdad was there. Now, I've, I've met him before. He's an older guy. He's an Anglican priest, bishop, probably a priest, I don't know, in Baghdad. He's been there for years. He is actually so trusted as a believer and so powerful that nations and tribes use him to broker alliances and agreements together. And he's had multiple threats on his life. They've had to sneak him around out of the city different places at times because he always has uh, terrorism uh, knocking at his door. And so they talked about it, and they said that he typically baptizes 15 people a month. Well, that's, that's pretty good for that part of the world. And he said... On the average, 10 of them are martyred within 30 days. He said, so the mentality in his church is, is that if you get baptized, you know what you're signing up for. There's two-thirds of a chance that, that you're going to, to be martyred. And yet they wholeheartedly, joyfully come into the waters of baptism knowing that that's the possibility. Now, when you, when you hang out with people that are in that environment, it's like a fragrance. I mean, I... I I had so much, there was so much fragrance in the room as you hear the, heard the stories. I mean, the, the level of, I, I got so, I got so passionate about, Lord, create within our church back in Cleveland a passionate army of people that are not just concerned about their own stuff, but have stepped out of themselves and understand what Jesus has called us to do. And by the way, we had that in very large degrees, but... I feel we're getting an upgrade right now. I feel there's something that's coming. I got an upgrade when I was out there. I was, I was, I was zapped so many times I got unzappable. I mean, it was just so, and it wasn't always by, you know, Holy Spirit lay hands on you and you get weak or something. It was by the profound connection that God has with me and what he has with you. I'm talking about me as an individual, not because of role or position. But as a, as a Christian, I felt like, Lord, you're really here. No, I know that. But certain things happen where the, an encounter with God is like the, the ceiling of the envelope. Amen. I mean, it's, it's, it's like it is done, man. I, I mean, even in, uh, what is it? Uh, I think it's the first John where they say, they talk about the Lord, that we, we, we saw him, we heard him, we felt him, we touched him as he handled the word. I mean, they're saying, I was there when it happened. That kind of encounter, if you had an encounter with the Lord today, don't just cast it off as like, well, well, that was kind of weird and I got just kind of a funny feeling. No, no, no. That's an invitation of the Lord coming near to you and you need to lean in toward the Lord. Yes. You say, Lord, I want you. I want you way. I, I think I want you way more than you want me, but apparently not. <laughs> you really 
have come toward me. And one guy, Michael Maiden, who pastors a very large church in, in uh, uh, thousands in uh, uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Humble man, probably in his late 60s. Really Mike, mild, meek kind of guy. You wouldn't pick him out of a crowd and says, that's probably a great man of God, you know. He's, he's, just a, he's a great guy. But he came over to me. It two times this happened. He prophesied over me. Now, you got to understand this prophecy. Uh, about three years ago, Katie Veach, who's on our staff as a children's uh, pastor, she gave me a bundle of uh, colored pencils, real thick colored pencils like this. And I remember when she gave them to me, I thought, oh, what am I going to use this for? I can't really highlight my Bible. I'll rip the page out with this thing. They're really sharp, multicolored pencils, and they're in this bundle, you know. And she, and in, in Katie style, she just kind of gave it to me and said, I don't know why, I just felt the Lord tell me to buy this for you. And so they've been sitting by my desk for three years, you know. And what happened was about two and a half years ago, I got this impression, something I felt God was speaking to me, and I looked over and saw those pencils, and I thought, well, I'm going to write it down. So I got one of the red pencils out, and I'm in the second floor of the prayer house out in Brunswick. It's where my office is. And the ceiling comes down like the roof line comes down. It's kind of a claustrophobic little room. <laughs> and uh, I started writing what the Lord was giving me up on it. Well, since then, I've been writing things all over my ceiling with these multicolored pencils. And behind my door, about three years ago, I established, two years ago, I established a prayer list. So if you open my door, behind the door, written on the wall, is my prayer list of things that I'm praying for. And some of them are very personal, you know, personal stuff, and some of it's my family, church, things like that, you know. So anyway, that's, that's the way my office looks. Uh, Michael Maiden comes over. He starts prophesying over me. He's never been here. He, he doesn't, I mean, he doesn't know me that well. We see each other once a year. Uh, but he starts prophesying over me, and, and he's going for it, man. It's, it's one of those words that's hitting right at the core of your heart. Like, whoa, whoa. That's powerful, you know. He comes to this point. He, said, he has this little phrase he says. He says, you're going to like this. It's really cool. So he said, well, he's prophesying. That's what he says. You're going to like this. It's, it's like God showing him stuff, and he gets excited about it. Yeah. He's like, okay, <laughs> here it is. He said, the things you've written on your wall, the Lord says, I see those. I'm about to accomplish those. <laughs> now, I know most of us take notes in one way or another. How many of you write on your walls at your home? Just <laughs> raise your hand around the room. Actually, there was five in Brunswick, so we got about five here. Well, good. Five other crazies with me. That's good. I mean, it's not typical. But when he said that, it was so intimate that the Lord, it's like the Lord saying, yeah. I've been there with you. Yeah. I was there when you wrote it. Yeah. And I want you to know when you wrote it, because you took that action of leaning into me toward you wrote it on a wall which is pretty significant, exactly. I'm coming and I'm going to deal with all those things. I mean, I was, I was ruined by it. I was ruined by it. Now, you know, I, they, I got great words when I was out there. I'm not going to tell you what they were, but I got great words out there. And, you know, if you get a word about stadiums and the sick, you know, coming out of wheelchairs and, you know, those are very powerful words. And those are always great words. If you get a word like that, God's going to use you to touch nations, blah, 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 and all that. You know, it's great. And I'm there, you know, I'm like, yeah, oh, it's great. It's awesome stuff, you know. But when it, when it comes down to the core of you, and your family, Amen. I'm wiped out. Amen. I'm wiped out because the Lord, of course the Lord wants me to touch nations. And of course the Lord wants me to bring people out of wheelchairs. Of course the Lord wants me to pray for the sick. But it doesn't dawn on me always that he's, he's concerned about a cloud and a sky that bring confirmation into your heart. An encounter with the Lord will transform your life. An encounter with the Lord may reveal your inadequacies, but only for the pur purpose of scooping those out of the way so that the greater good of God can arise in your heart. The kindness of God leads to repentance. Now, look with me, if you could, at this verse. In uh, 3 John, verse 2, 3 John, verse 2, I'm closing with this. <laughs> Been a while since I've done this, but I'm going to close with this verse. Over this next, next week, so I'm talking, I'm doing a series on prosper. Now, I know as soon as I say prosper, people think money, and it does include that. But it's way bigger than that. It's about living a life in God that has removed us out of the grind. So many of us, particularly in American culture, 
we, we're in this grind of stuff, and, and you know, it's different stuff for different people. If I could just pay my bills off, I'll be in a better position to serve the Lord. If I could just get this addiction dealt with in my life, I'll be a better place to serve the Lord. We have all this reason why. Let me tell you something, you're never going to get out of that grind. Because the Bible says in Matthew, first of all, in Matthew, he says, look at the birds of the field. Do you see them toil? Yet they never go hungry. Look at the li li lilies of the field. I mean, he said, I tell you the truth. Jesus said this. <laughs> that Solomon in all his glory is not as beautiful as this. Who clothed them? I did. I mean, the, Lord, the Lord's presenting an argument. He's saying, if I'm concerned about the birds that have no soul, and I'm concerned about the flowers that have no soul, how much more, and by the way, several times in the Bible when you see the Father mentioned, and, and Matthew would be one of those, Matthew 6. When the Father's mentioned, it's, it's in conjunction with this little phrase called much more. Father, much more. Father, much more. The Father has much more for every one of you in this room. Hallelujah. You know what he says at the end of Matthew? He, he, Matthew 6, he says this. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. The Lord's saying over here in the grind, if you just get out of that and say, wait a minute, maybe if I sowed my life into this, I mean, I've seen it with finances. Finance is always a huge example of this. You know, people saying that I can't tithe until I get out of debt or I can't tithe until I pay off these bills. I, you know, and I, I don't argue with them because I, I, we're all on a journey together I know the principles. I practice the principles of my life, but I, I know, and if, if I'm allowed to do it, I, I'll talk to them about it. But I'll say, you know what? Actually, there's a kingdom principle that if you will sow over here, he'll take care of this. It doesn't make sense. I agree. But if you will sow into that, I mean, they go, oh, no, 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 that's the law. No, I'm a student of the Bible. It came up 400 years before the law ever existed. Amen. Abraham. Isaac, Jacob. I mean, Abraham came from a great victory. The first thing he did is he tithed. He poured out of himself. He poured out of himself out of gratitude to God. There's something about when you pour out of yourself in service and giving of whatever it looks like in all those ways. And by the way, God's called us in multiple ways to pour out. It says in Isaiah 58, if you extend your soul toward the poor, will I not make your midnight into a noonday? I mean, he says, poor out your soul, extend your soul in a way that you think, well, I'm not in a position to do that right now. It's the best time to do it because it takes faith. You extend your soul in that. You give, you serve, you bless, whatever it is. You're kind to that person at work. When you do that, it opens up something in the heavenly realm and it recalibrates your whole life. Everything gets shifted. You were at a midnight, now you're at a noonday. You had terrors of the night, now you've got the blessing during the day. It just swirls right around, you know. But this verse right here, it, it's, a, it's a New Testament greeting. I wish I had more time, but I'm out of it. 3 John 2 says this, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper. This is John speaking to his buddy, Gaius. He says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Now that second part is really important. Just as your soul prospers. Everyone in this room who's in Jesus Christ has the prosperity of eternal life upon your head. You have been guaranteed life eternal in Jesus by his shed blood, not because of your works, just because of the goodness of God. You yielded your life. You said, Lord, I give it all to you. I don't know if you sang the song today. We sang it, I think, maybe in the early service, Lay It All Down. Lay It All Down. I mean, that song goes deep into my spirit. It's always a reminder, like, yeah, you get fixed on these things, my dreams, my bucket list, my, 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 I, 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 And you say, no, lay it all down, lay it all down, lay it all down. Whatever it takes, Lord, you are the purpose of my life and my dream. And when you do that, amazing things happen. So this, this was so common among early Christians that it became just a, a greeting. I mean, it'd be like Jason. I pray that you might prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. When a believer knows my soul is rich, 
in Christ. Does this mean that it extends outside of that richness to normal things of life? My physical needs, my family? Absolutely. There's a loving God who thinks that about you. One last story in my last three minutes here. You know, my father, I've told this story many times. My father was not a Christian the first 19 years of my life. In fact, he was pretty much on the other end of the spectrum. But he did honor biblical principles. He tithed. And he even gave of his time. He would, he would host evangelists that would come in. They'd make meals for him and everything. But he wouldn't go to church and he didn't really honor the Lord because he understood. And he would tell me, he'd say, well, I believe the principle is accurate. I'm like, well, give your life to Jesus Christ. You know, it's a little aggravating, you know. My brother's a pastor. I'm a pastor, you know. And, and he was far from the Lord. And uh, one of the things he raised me in is that we had this big uh, moonshine jug about this big sitting by the door you know, a big ceramic jug. And every day he'd come home, he'd take his change out, drop it in the jug. And, uh, you know, sometime of the year, we'd use that when we're on vacation or something like that. And it was kind of a little family thing. You know, actually, it was there so long, we never really noticed it. Other people come in and go, what's the jug? Well, long story. You know, it's my dad's pocket change. It amounts to some money by the end of the year. But when I got my first job, and it was, I was like 15 years old, and I came home, I had about $32 in my pocket. I don't know why I remember that, but... He, he said, he said, so how was your first day? I said, it was good. And he said, uh, did they pay you? I said, yeah, they did, because I was in a job where they were paying me uh, daily, you know. He said, well, how much did you get? I said, well, I'm not sure. He said, let's see. So I got my wallet out. I looked in there, and I said, $32. Now, I, was, I think I was 15 years old. And he said, uh, well, that's pretty good. He said, what are you going to do with it? I said, I don't know. Pay my bills, I guess. And he said, uh, I got a deal for you. He said, how about if you give me everything in your wallet for what's in that jug over there? Now, I'm not a dummy. So I said, can I lift the jug? <laughs> I said, no. I said, when was the last time you emptied the jug? I don't remember. Do you know how much money's in the jug? No. He says, time's running out. You need to make a decision. Now, here's the deal. I said, yes. You know, Lindy Conant, who does that, lay it all down. She, she says, there's a yes in your heart that, that goes through eternity. Simple obedience. What's the rest of it? Changes history. And so I, one thing my dad taught me was always to say yes and then worry about the con consequences later on. And so I said, yes. He said, well, give me the money. So I give him the $32. So the jug's yours. I went over there, I poured it out. And I remember looking at it thinking, I don't think that's $32. I mean, there's a lot of pennies in there, you know. And I, I looked at them. And anyway, I started adding them up, you know, and counting it. He came in later on and said, so how much was in there? And I said, $110. He said, good. I was hoping so. Now, he did that to me a number of times in my life, even later on with bigger items. He was teaching me to be a risk taker. He was teaching me to say, and he was teaching me to be a quick decision maker, you know, to, to say, Yes, I'll do that. And the reason I could do that, I, I figured this out after a few times. I thought, wait a minute. He knows how much money's in that jug. Or at least he has an idea because he's my father. And it turns out that if you've got a loving father, he really wants your benefit. And so you're not afraid. If you think God is a, not a loving father, you're going to afraid you're going you're gonna to get the bad end of the deal. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And I'm not going to get nothing out of it. I mean, you don't understand the love of God. How much more, much more will your heavenly father? Amen. Amen. And so he taught me how to prosper. He taught me how to understand people, what they're asking and responding quickly and making decisions, all that. Before he was ever a believer, later on he became a believer and he traveled with me all over the world. We had a blast together. He was actually my assistant. You know, he's a big union leader and he left that and became my assistant. You know, we had a blast. We, we had so much fun together. I can tell you many stories about it. But here's the bottom line. If he did nothing else, he implanted me an understanding that if God says he's a father, he wants only your best in every area of of your life. Let's all stand together if we could. Whoa. I'm believing God for encounters for everyone in this room this week. Big ones, small ones, fingerprints of God on your life that are going to 
remove the veils that have been there and reveal the blessing that's always been there. Martin Luther removed the veil by writing songs in the common language in his area, German, in order to bring liberation to thousands of people and ultimately to millions of people. Right up to you and me right now. Because he wanted everyone to know how good God was after his tormenting life, how good God was. <laughs> it's funny, with all of his fears and everything, I think I mentioned this last week, his final prayer was basically a worship to the God of the wind and the storms. The things that he had feared, now he saw God as a loving God moving through those things. So right now, there's some changes going on in people's minds. Some of you are even having an encounter right now where you feel change of mind, a cognitive revival, a cognitive reform. Your thinking is being transformed. The Bible says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed to the renewing of your mind. The Bible calls us to have the mind of Christ. And right now, in the name of Jesus, some of you that are stuck, somehow something I said today makes, makes you think, you know what, there's... I got, there's some things I need to break out in. If that's you right now, raise your hand around this room. I'm going to pray for you all around this room. Some areas I need to break out of, I need to think differently about. I've, I've become locked. A lot of people, about a third of the people in this room are raising their hands. But we speak right now around this room to these folks. I ask, Lord, for supernatural coordination of an agenda from heaven upon their life this week. That this week, Lord, you're going to recalibrate thinking and hearts in this room to a greater liberation in Christ. Let me tell you, the distress you're experiencing is not from God. The fear you're experiencing is not from God. In fact, the Bible says perfect love casts out fear. So we speak right now to fear of expansion, fear of growth, fear of taking risk, fear of genuinely seizing what God has called you to do. We, we speak to that right now. We break its hold over everyone in this room, even those that were afraid to raise their hand. <laughs> And I bless them, Lord God, with a good God that loves them more than they can ever imagine. And I pray, Lord, for whatever I received out in Reading this week, Lord, and somehow that just gets transferred to this group. There's a sense of like, yeah, it's a new day. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not going to be held back any longer. Yes, God has good things in store for me. The Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of above there is no shadow of turning in him we declare right now the good God Jesus Christ to speak into your life that you might be reformed resurrected and a new renaissance of optimism joy peace and righteousness in the name of Lord Jesus Bethel Cleveland I bless you and you're rising up you're lying down you're coming in you're going forth may the favor grace and mercy of God richly Rest upon you every moment of every day of this week. May you feel the presence of the Lord near, and may he show himself strongly to you all this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Any prayer teams that are here, come up to the front. Anyone who needs ministry, prayer, prophetic words, healing, come up here to the front. Our prayer teams will pray for you. If those teams, Joel, if those teams could quickly come up here and get uh, scattered across the front here, it would be great. We want to pray for you on ministry. The rest of you will see you throughout the week. Don't forget next Sunday night at the Q, 4 o'clock, extraordinary battle against racism across the country. We're going to worship together with people of all colors, all backgrounds, and see God move powerfully on the city of Cleveland. God bless. Have a great week.